We're in the 20th chapter book of Exodus, but I have been reading from a commentary that covers hundreds of years of study. And it is uh, not very available, especially because it is written in Latin and Greek and Hebrew, so many people cannot read it. It is a column de leash, volume one, it's talking about the holiness of God. That's the title of this message. Is, it's talking about the law, but we're talking about the holiness of God. And the law shows forth the holiness of God. Because God is that holy. He is that holy. And He wants us to know how holy He is so we understand how far the gap between God and us is. There's a lot, there's a great gap between our limited holiness, except for the blood of Jesus Christ, and the real holiness, the true holiness of God. And page 98, in the second book of Moses, as it is said here, we come down, it tells us that uh, the church of the living God is bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. All of the plagues in the book of Exodus relate to how God redeemed Israel out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world, and the world that we live in is a type of Egypt. And God redeems us out of that. When we get over here to the book of Revelation and to the tribulation period at the end of the church age, we're going to see those, those miracles of judgment again. And the writers here talk about that. The promises made in the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ, and I'm so excited about getting to the book of Matthew also. I'm going to go through the four Gospels and reading after we finish this. The book of Exodus, we're going to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read every one of them and what it's talking about there as we read them. I'm already studying, therefore, to do that. Here on this page, the kingship in the world today is a merely a spiritual kind. God is kings over his church and over his saved, the redeemed, and the family of God, and especially in the church of the living God. Not everybody that is saved is part of a New Testament church. There are a few saved Catholics, possibly. There are saved Lutherans. There are some saved Pentecostals. But none of these churches are part of the bride. They're not part of the bride. There are many saved people outside of God's churches. The bride is a very special, has a very special relationship with God. And all of what we see in the Old Testament is pointing us to that. It's pointing us to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Genesis 3.15, and John 1.1, 1 1, John 1.14, 1 John 1.18. We see all this... Matthew, the first chapter, that we are the, 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 the recipient of God becoming flesh and dying for us on the cross of Calvary because we couldn't get to heaven without him. Simple as that. Couldn't get to heaven without Jesus. Now, different writers have said here over the years, that believers are lords over the death and the devil and hell and the evil. But culminates in a universal sway foretold by Balaam. In other words, many writers in the past go too far. We are not in a literal kingdom today on earth. God is not in control, total control of the earth because it's still Satan's kingdom. The God of this age is Satan. But I'm looking forward to seeing him put away. 
in prison where he ought to be. For 1,000 years, he's going to be put in prison during the millennial reign with all of his little imps with him, too. Right now, he's alive and well and active in the world. You don't think, you don't believe that? Just look at Washington, D.C. Look at the different kingdoms of the world. The African kingdoms, uh, Islamic kingdom, you don't believe that Satan is alive and well, he's working well in those kingdoms and doing things every day that defy God. But God is going to win in the end. But God is not in complete control of the world today. He will bring it back under his control at the end of the tribulation period. And he will establish his kingdom on earth. Romans the 13th chapter tells us that, uh, that God originally set up kingdoms under the what we call the, the government, a human government. He, he set up kingdoms that, that uh, human government that good people would be protected from bad people and that all people would be protected from the government. Thomas Jefferson said that the Constitution is a chain that binds the viciousness of government. The Constitution was very necessary to chain government officials. And we need to remember that. We need to tell everyone that they ought to take allegiance of office saying that. The Constitution is a chain that binds the maliciousness of government. And do we have a lot of maliciousness up there right now? Let's go on and look at this a little bit further now. The saints of the Most High God, the eternal life is the ultimate end of their calling. Eternal life in the resurrection is the ultimate end of the calling of God's people. God calls you to himself. That kingdom is not ready yet. Even though New Jerusalem is probably waiting up there someplace already, he's building that four square city right now for us. But it's not down here shining like light above the earth. The spiritual attitude of Israel towards the nations is a result of priestly character. And Israel to Israel, God was a national treasure. An asset. Israel was taken out of Egypt, but it took many years to get Egypt out of Israel. And God's still working on it right here. God's showing how holy he is and how unholy they are and how unholy Egypt was. As the priest is a mediator between God and man, so Israel was called to be a vehicle of knowledge and salvation of God to all the nations around it. Instead of that, they stuck their nose in the air and treated them like dirt, the other nations. Jesus said, I haven't seen at many times of doing the miracles and in his earthly ministry, he said, I haven't seen such faith in Israel. By this vehicle of grace to the world, it is unquestionably acquired in the intellectual and spiritual character, but this includes, rather than excludes, the government of the world. For spiritual and intellectual supremacy and rule must eventually ensure the government of the world. In other words, God, in the end, Israel was offered the millennial reign when Jesus came. They didn't want it. They had all they wanted, they had all the power, they had all the pride. Their noses were in the air and they didn't want God's kingdom. They wanted their kingdom. They told Pontius Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. When he said, this is your king, he said, we have no king but Caesar. If Israel had attained 
the kingdom of God in Jesus' ministry, we would have been in the millennium all this time. And over into the eternal ages. Malachi. The government over the nation solely as a priestly nation. The apostle Peter, when talking, taking up his promise in 1 Peter 2 and 9, might without hesitation follow the Septuagint rending of Basileu Eratumai, a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood today. You know that? You're sons and daughters of the king. You are royalty. Reality, you are royalty. King James thought he was an absolute emissary of God, and God put him on the throne. That's the way he looked at things. Until America, the experiment of America came, nobody had any rights anywhere in the world. It was all under the thumb and the hard, harsh hand of rulers that every one of them thought they were chosen by God. Or at least they made the excuse for what they did, that they were chosen of God. Now in us, the spirit that lives in us, we are able to overcome the world by the grace of God. We are able to overcome. Israel was supposed to lay the power, the foundation of God's kingship, and when he came to them, they were supposed to say, here it is, Lord. When the, John the Baptist was proclaiming the Messiah to come, he said, I am the voice crying in the wilderness, one to make way the way the straight of the Lord, our King and our Savior. And John believed that Jesus was going to walk into the throne of Israel and take over the world. He believed that. So did the apostles. And Israel didn't want it. The priestly kingdom or royal priesthood, for there is no difference between the two. The kingship being founded upon the priesthood and the priesthood uh, completely founded on the kingship. We have no royal priesthood. Israel had no royal priesthood without their king. Israel had no royal priesthood without the king and they rejected the king. Now today, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to save our souls and, and, save, and, and to forgive us of our sins, we have surrendered our lives to the king. He's the king. He is the king. And he's a holy king. For the kingdom of priests to be reality on earth, Israel had to be a holy nation. And in the law we're about to study lays the foundation for that holy nation, and they broke every law. Every one. They broke it all. It quotes Latin here quite extensively for about a half a page. I won't go into that, except that saying this, that God generated Israel, Genes, generated, birthed Israel to become a holy nation and a holy reference to the world. A holy nation and a holy reference to the world, and they were to keep that law of those commandments to shine forth how glorious and holy God was and to point the world to him, not them, to him. There is a certain dignity that we must give to God in accepting Him as our Savior. There is a certain dignity. We look upon Him as our Savior and our God and our King and our Lord over our lives. Israel was to be elevated by Jehovah among all the other nations if they would have followed Him. Remember, if, the conditional. The covenant that God made with Israel is a conditional covenant. The Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are unconditional covenants. The only reason why God will bring Israel back into covenant relationship with him under the administration of the millennial reign is because of the Davidic covenant.
Now it goes on here. They quote so much Greek and Hebrew and Latin in here that you have to know these languages to actually understand what it's saying in Colin Delis. So I will be your interpreter to some extent. Israel was supposed to be a separate nation from all the nations. Separate but holy. It cannot be shown that Kadesh, Kadesh means holy, Kadesh HaKadoshim is the holy of holies. Israel was supposed to be the holy nation among the, all the people of, Israel, of, of the world. They were supposed to stand out as morally superior and with a superior form of government. The word Kadesh means high and holy. High and holy. It means uh, spiritually pure, untarnished. Splendid. What are we supposed to be related to? Hadesh or Kadesh, the newly shining moonlight, the mo newly shining moonlight. When the moon comes up, it comes up so bright. Then right at the horizon, it is so bright. It's so big. As it goes in the sky, it gets smaller. But Jesus, the the glory of God is like the rising of the sun and the rising of the moon. Newly shining moonlight. And it said, compare it with the Sanskrit, dikash, to be splendid or beautiful. In either case, the primary meaning of the word is to be splendid, pure, untarnished, bright. Diso it says, correctly observed that the holiness of God and Israel is most closely connected with the covenant relationship. But he is wrong in the conclusion that he, which lies draws from the name that the holy was originally only a relative term, and that a thing was holy so far as it was property of God. God, when God touches something, it becomes holy. When God touches this earth and changes this earth, at the end of the, of the millennial reign, it will become holy because he touched it. You become holy because he touched you. The Ark of the Covenant became holy because he touched it. Aaron's rod was holy because he touched it. The commandments were holy because God touched them. For the whole earth is Jehovah's property. But it is not holy on that account. Jehovah is not holy only so far as within the covenant, but he is possession and possessor, absolute life and the source of life, and above all, both the chief good and the chief model for his people. Jesus Christ is our chief model. The Jehovah Witnesses make him a creation of God. The Mormons make him a creation of God. Jesus Christ is our brother, not our God, according to Mormonism. Jesus Christ is the creator. Jesus Christ is Jehovah that became flesh, John 1.14 and 1.18. Jesus Christ is the eternal one, John 1.1. 1, 1. Jesus Christ was totally separate from all of his disciples in holiness, wasn't he? I say this so many times when, when I pray to God, as Peter says, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Lord, I'm a sinner. Peter finally came to God and said, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinful man. We are all sinful men, we're all sinful women because we are living in tarnished, corrupted flesh. Jesus was a completely, totally separate one, a holy one among all the world. The whole world has seen of him, the whole world makes, makes a, a shame upon him or worships him one or the other. One enclosed within himself is self-existent and self-holy. 
in contrast with the world to which he does not belong, but holiness pertains to God alone. Holiness pertains to God alone. You're only holy. You're only hagios. We're only not of this earth, but you're born of God. <coughs> And because we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we participate in His holiness. Did you know that? Because we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we participate in His holiness. Because we are redeemed. <clears throat> God is creator and preserver of the world, but to God as the redeemer of mankind. Light is the, is the earthly reflection of His holy nature. The sun is a reflection of God's holiness. The moon is a reflection of God's holiness. The Holy One of Israel is the light of Israel. Isaiah 10 and 17 and 1 Timothy 6 and 16. The light with its purity and splendor is the most suitable earthly element to represent the brilliant and spotless purity of the Holy One of Israel. Israel came along. Jesus rubbed elbows with sinners. Did you know that? He rubbed elbows with you, didn't he? Jesus rubbed elbows with sinners. And the, the nation of Israel, the, the leaders of the nation of Israel complained. Even his own disciples complained about Jesus mingling with sinners. You remember there in John, the, the fourth chapter, where he came there to the well of Samaria, of Samaria, and the Samaritan woman came out there that uh, was of doubtful character. She had been married several times, and she was living with somebody else's wife now, husband that is. And the Lord said to her, I am the light of the world. I am the Messiah. And he spoke to her, like I'm speaking to you right now, in person, so to speak. He spoke to her. He said, he said, when she said, when Messiah comes, where shall we worship? Here or in Jerusalem? He said, we in Jerusalem, we have the word of God. We have the, the, we have the oracles of God. They had the Pentateuch. Yeah, they, they worshiped. They had the five books of Moses, and that's all that they would read or anything. They still had sacrifices, and etc., etc. But Jesus said, we know who we worship. In other words, you're wrong here. But come a time, and even as now, when those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth. And she was so changed by Him that she went and told the city, the Messiah has come, and they went out, the whole city just poured out to him. And she was a great, brilliant light. She shined Jesus' light. From her, the light of Jesus went into that city, and they followed that light out to Jesus, the real light. The light is the earthly perfection of his holy nature, and the Holy One of Israel is the light of Israel. It is brilliant, it is spotless, in purity, and the Holy One, in whom there is no interchange of light and darkness. God is called the Holy One because He is altogether pure, clear, and spotless light, so that in the idea of the holiness of God, there are embodied the absolute moral purity and perfection of divine nature, His unclouded glory. He did not marry Mary and Magdalene and raise kids, nor Martha, as the Mormons will say. They just jumped up and down when the movie Da Vinci Code came out. Whoa, 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 boy. See, we told you all the time. We're, Joseph Smith was a descendant of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. Jesus didn't come in this world to have kids. If they did, they would have been like him. They would have had the blood of God in them. We have the Spirit of God in us now, but we still have the blood of Adam in us, which dooms us to a grave. Every day, every year, I get closer to the grave. 
I feel it in my bones and my spirit and my nervous system, everything. I see my body laying down, and I don't want it to lay down. I still have work to do. God will figure out when the work is done. <clears throat> These are inseparable attributes of God. But in relation to the world, they are so far distinguished that the whole world is full of His glory. In reality, as we go up out here over all these mountains, and I just love living in Fish Lake Valley. I love going up a mountain. Do you like that, Marilyn? Yeah, it's beautiful because we see the glory of God as God had created. We see places up there that man has not touched. It has no contamination. It's all wild. It's all as God created it. While it is too and in Israel that His holiness is displayed at the world today, it is by the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ that the holiness of God is displayed in the world. Mm -hmm. It is. I believe that. It is by and through the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ that the holiness of God is displayed in the world today. It's manifested in His creation and His preservation of the world, and His holy name, and in the election and guidance of Israel, along with His church. The calling out of the church, the word ecclesia, church, means one's called out. That is God's elect. We are called out. God has displayed the glory of His name in the creation of the heavens and the earth and even the rising of the sun and the rising of the moon and the changing of the seasons. Everything, the pureness of the snow upon, upon the land, the cleansing of the earth in the wintertime, the going to sleep of the trees and the waking up in spring representing the resurrection, the Anastasia. But his way was supposed to be showed to the world through Israel. The work of God in his kingdom of grace is holy. The work of God in grace is holy. For in grace you're having been saved through faith, and that is not a gift, that is not of yourself. Faith doesn't come for us. I am so I laugh when the faith healers say, Well, you didn't have faith. Faith comes from God. We don't generate it, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The gifts are gone, people. Talking in tongues and all of that are over with. There won't be any miracles and won't be any prophets until the tribulation comes, and we're not in the tribulation period. People, we're in the church age. Get your mind straightened out. The glory of God which streams forth in the material creation is manifested as holiness in His saving work for a sinful world to rescue it from the plethora of sin, the death, and restore it to the glory of eternal life. God rescues us from eternal death to eternal life. He rescues us from worldlings to godlings. And that is manifested here in the fact that by counsel of his own spontaneous love, Deuteronomy 4, 37, he chose Israel as his possession to make it a holy nation if it hearkened to his voice and kept his covenant conditional. I thank God that our salvation is not conditional. It's only conditional on God alone, not us. We fail God every day. God placed the chosen people in relation to a covenant fellowship with himself, founded his kingdom in Israel. And God called his church out when Israel rejected him. He called out his church and placed it in the world and said, you're going to go get being scattered throughout the world. And when you're scattered throughout the world, make disciples, habitual learners. Baptize those disciples, those disciples, dip them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Tell them to guard with their lives that which I've entrusted unto them. And lo, I'll be with you until the end of the age. That church did not die out ever, ever, ever. I remember 
Dr. Benjamin Marcus Bogart, he, he said, Baptists are like bees. He said, from the very creation of the bees and the gardener before the Garden of Eden, there's never been a time when there haven't been bees because there's bees in the world today. Whether you saw them or not, they're there. A river will run underground sometimes and come back up and just flow out across the dry plains. With the means of obtaining the expiation of their sins and securing righteousness before God and the holiness of life with God in order that by his, his discipline of his holy commandments under the guidance of his holy arm that he might train and guide them to the holiness and glory of divine life. But as sin opposes holiness, the sinner resists sanctification and the work of the holiness of God reveals himself in his kingdom of grace. When you're saved, you want to be holy whether you are or not. You want to be holy. You want your mind to be cleansed of ungodliness. You want your life to be holy because that's what God wants out of you. He wants that for you. His kingdom is a kingdom of grace. Not only positively in the sanctification of those who suffer themselves to be sanctified and raised to a newness of life, but negatively also in the destruction of all those who obstinately refuse the guidance of His grace so that the glory of the three Holy One, the Christ Holy One, Isaiah 6 and 3 will be fully manifested both in the glorification of his chosen people and deliverance of the whole creation from the bondage of corruption. The, the creation itself cries for the redemption of God and to the glorious liberty of the children of God in Romans 8, 21 and also in the destruction of the hardened sinners, the annihilation of everything that is ungodly in this world and the final overthrow of Satan and his kingdom, founding of the new heaven and new earth. It's not only in every person whom God received into his sphere of his sin-destroying grace, Kaddish, are holy, but everything which is applied to the realization of the divine work of salvation are consecrated by God in this object, the opposite, Kadesh as ta'al konos profanus to be loose unbound not devoted to holy purposes Leviticus 10 and 10 and this term was applied not only to what was sinful and unclean but to everything earthly in the natural condition because the whole earth with all that is upon it has been involved in the consequences of sin. The whole earth suffers in sin today. We have diseases among cattle, we have diseases among horses, we have diseases among rabbits, we have diseases among squirrels. Everything that crawls on top down in the earth and in the ocean and upon the ocean. Everything is plagued with parasites. You know, we've been suffering from this COVID uh, disaster for, well, since 2019. Whether it was created by the nation of China to, to break the world or what it was, how it was created, it is a terrible, terrible disease. Marilyn and I just went over the Omicron version of it. I hurt so bad for six days I could not sleep. Many people have COVID and then die of a heart attack not long afterward because it affects your heart. It affects all, everything in you. I've heard a lot of people say, I caught COVID, but I'm not going to take any of those shots. And I said, well, you got your shot. If you got COVID, you got a natural immunity. People are afraid of medicine sometimes. People are afraid of God. God prescription 
inoculation for hell is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. Our Father, we send this message out for your honor and glory. Please use it throughout the world wherever it goes. Please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.